We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. So would you join me in that by taking your Bibles and turning with me again to Romans. This morning we'll be in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12 this morning. There is a lot of discussion in our day and age about the need for unity. We hear it all the time in every venue from communities, states, our nation, whether it be over issues, whether it be over politics, whether it be over decisions that are being made. We hear about it, and yes, in the church as well, that we need to be unified, that we need to be united, that we need to be together. Now, how many of you would agree that we need to be a unified people? Most people would agree with that. But I would tell you this. It is possible that we need to be unified. But when we talk about unity, you cannot unify and you cannot unite unless you are unifying, unless you are uniting over the truth. You see, friends, unity for the sake of unity is chaos. Unity for the sake of truth is what God has called us to. And yet we also hear so much about the need for diversity. And obviously, diversity is absolutely essential. We look around and recognize that this world is very, very different. It's made up of very, very different people. And there is a need for that. And it's not just in the world, but there's a need for diversity in the church. I thank God that everyone in this church is not like you. And me. I'm thankful that we're different. I'm thankful that you bring different experiences. I'm thankful that you bring different backgrounds. I'm thankful that you bring different opinions. I'm thankful that you bring different preferences. I'm thankful that the church coming together is one of the greatest miracles that you will ever see because when we come to church, essentially, though you may not consciously think about this every time we're walking in the door, we're laying down everything that divides so that we can unite over the fact that hopefully all of you are here because you agree, even though you may disagree on many, many things, you agree that he is worthy. Amen? So in the church, we need unity and we need diversity. The question is, how do we maintain both? And that has been an issue for over 2,000 years in the church. And you're going to see in just a few moments that it was an issue even in the first century church. And so Paul has been describing in this section of Romans what it looks like to love one another, to love God and to love the people of God. And so specifically today, he's going to continue that discussion about how we can love one another by explaining that we must maintain unity and diversity within the church and answering the question for us, how do we maintain both? So stand with me and we'll discover that together. Romans chapter 14, I begin in verse 1. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One's man, one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another, another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives, th gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. 
so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Lord, teach us today that we must maintain unity and diversity within this church. Teach us today, through your word, how to maintain both. Help me to get out of the way of this powerful Bible passage and teach people. Lord, I pray that you would give them ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, please be seated. So if we're going to maintain unity and diversity within the church, how are we able to maintain both? Three ways this passage describes very clearly that we need to keep in front of us. And the first is this. We need genuine acceptance of one another. We need genuine acceptance of one another. In the first four verses, he says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. And he goes on in the next few verses and gives us examples of some of those disputable matters. In fact, he talks about um, diet. He talks about celebrating certain special days. Now, it may be that when you read this, you say, Well, Larry, you could have skipped this section of Romans because we have very few vegetarians in here, praise God. Um, But you need to understand what was going on then so you can see why it's important today. And what was taking place was that Paul wanted to make sure that inside the church, the body of Christ, that there weren't groups of people who prohibited things that weren't strictly prohibited in Scripture, that they didn't mandate things that weren't specifically mandated in Scripture. So they didn't make things sin that God had not specifically talked about. But when he uses the term strong and weak, you you could use the terms mature and immature in that. And what Paul was saying to the Roman church is, inside the Roman church, remember, you had new Gentile converts and you had new Jewish converts. Now, the reason this was a big deal for the Jews is, think about what they came out of. And for some of them, even when they were converted to Christianity, diet was not only a big deal, but also ceremony was a big deal. Even the Sabbath was a big deal. Certain special days were a big deal. They had trouble giving up certain ceremonial laws, practices, dietary, even sacrifices. And so what Paul is saying, now obviously Paul is not arguing for a works-based faith. He's made that clear in Romans and every other epistle. But what he is saying is you have some Jewish believers that have come into the fold that their lives have been so entrenched in these things that you don't need to make this an issue of their salvation if they still choose, if they still choose to have some dietary restrictions, if they still choose to celebrate some special days, as long as they understand that those days days and that diet does not save them, then those of you who may have been saved longer that understand it a little bit better, you don't need to make this an issue where you break fellowship with these people who have just come into the fold of God and you need to have a little bit more sympathy, empathy, and understanding of people as they come into the family of God. But it wasn't just the Jews that had a problem. You see, the Gentiles had some issues too and the Jews judged them. So you had an issue that was taking place within the church because a lot of the Gentiles that had been saved, do you remember what they got saved out of? The most pagan, heathen society that you could imagine. In fact, everywhere there were Roman, this Roman pantheon of gods was everywhere. And there was always sacrifices to the gods. And then after they sacrificed to the gods, they would take the meat that had been sacrificed to the gods and they would sell it in the market. Well, many of the Jews had no problem going to buy that meat and eating it because there are no other gods the Jews believe. So whether or not it got sacrificed to another god or not makes no difference to us. But to the Gentiles, it was repulsive to think about eating meat that had been sacrificed to the deities that they had just gotten saved out of that form of pagan religion and it rolled their stomach to even think about. So at this stage in their development, in their salvation, they They weren't ready to eat that meat yet. And what is Paul saying? Paul's saying there is room in the church for the Jews who are still struggling a little bit to figure out how they take in all of their tradition and everything that they've ever done and become part of a Christian church. And there's also room for Gentiles who came out of a pagan influence. And when you come together, you need to realize that the Bible commands things specifically. And we're not talking about this morning those things that the Bible directly commands. The things that the Bible directly commands, that's obvious. We're talking about places 
places where, to use a modern phrase, there is some gray area. That there are some ways in which people can disagree, people can have personal convictions, but there are actual places that you could have a different conviction than I have, but as long as you're living out your conviction to the Lord and I'm living out my conviction to the Lord, we could both be serving Jesus and we could agree to disagree on that and you could treat me as a brother in Christ and I could treat you as a sister in Christ and we could move on and not tear the church up about it. At first glance, this passage may be one that you think, well, I don't know that there's a ton that, that we're going to glean from this. But the more I studied it, the more for today and age, today's day and age, I think it may be one of the more relevant passages that you've studied in a long, long time. You see, the problems happen when two groups destroy the unity and the witness of a church when they are fighting about, bickering about items that aren't strictly prohibited in Scripture. Sometimes these things come from personal preference. This happened 2,000 years ago and it happened now. Do you know right now some of you like some things that others of you don't like? Did you know that? And it's not just about young people and old people. It's in general. Sometimes it's about personal preferences. Can we be honest? Some of your taste, if I had to look at it, I would go, I don't like that at all. And some of you, if you knew what I personally liked, you'd think, man, why does he like that? But if it's not com specifically commanded in Scripture, then it's fine with me. As long as the clothing is not distasteful, if you want to wear it and it's ugly, okay. <laughs> right? But sometimes it's not just preference. Sometimes it's tradition. Now, all of us come from different traditions. It would be fascinating the number of you that are listening right now, if we thought about the traditions you came from. Now, biblically, we're talking about Jews that came from a different tradition and Gentiles that came from a different tradition. But even those Jews grew up in different families and different places. Those Gentiles grew up in different towns and different places. They were in Rome, which were, it was a melting pot where people came together. When you take a church, then God has blessed us, blessed us, blessed us with people over the years. And he has brought people from all over the place. And when that happens, there's not one of you that has the exact same background. We're, re we're coming up on the holidays. If you want to see how every one of us is different, just ask anybody in here how they think the holidays ought to be celebrated. Now, what you'll find out is, is that every one of your families did it a little bit different. And some people will get fighting mad over specifically what dishes should be served. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you will lose your mind over whether or not the sweet potatoes have marshmallows on the top. Y'all are going to probably talk about that in Sunday school. We had come from different preferences. We come from different traditions. We come at this from so many different ways. And diversity is one of the strengths of the church. When people come together, when we form a team of people, we want people that know different things and are experienced in different things and have different backgrounds but So diversity is a, the strength of the church. But Satan always wants to take a strength and pervert it. And what Satan wants to do is take the strength of the diversity of the church and pervert it into division. Diversity is good. Division is bad. And it is a blurred line that can take place in any church and it can happen that quickly when people quit making the main thing the main thing and they hold on more to their preferences and they hold on more to their traditions and they hold on more to their likes and their dislikes and they tell you this is how their granddaddy did it and they think about that all of the time to the point where we don't even respect each other's differences and before you know it, we're not fighting over deep issues of theology we're not fighting over things that really matter we're not standing on gospel centered issues we're fighting about some of the most ridiculous garbage that you can imagine have any of you ever seen a church do that somewhere along the line that church forgot that the church is not about you that you forgot that the church is not here to serve you that you forgot that the church is not about your wants and your whims. That the church is not even about your tradition. That the church 
is about the only one who is worthy to take the key and open the scroll. And friends, if we can't unite over that, then we have forgotten the purpose of the existence of the church of Jesus Christ. That's Paul's point. But see, most people are tempted in one way or the other. And most Christians fall into one of these two categories when we talk about temptation. I'm not talking about a specific sin, but one of two ways tempts you. And there is the the Christian who, and this may be the predominant place that people fall. The Christian that, that falls into the place where they want to abuse their Christian liberty. This is the Christian who quickly says, well, you know, grace is grace forgives and it's easier to get forgiveness than it is permission and it's probably fine anyway and and so I'm going to kind of do what I want to do. There's a lot of that and it has produced what some have called Christian hedonism. But the other side of that is there's always people in churches who fall more towards legalism where they're I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this and I'm still even though I'm saved by grace I still need to earn God's approval. And so what you have sometimes is both are sinful attitudes. And what we need to do is check ourselves and recognize that there may be some, a little bit too much Christian liberty in some of your lives, and there may be a little bit too much legalism in some of your lives. And when we come back together, we're able to see that somewhere in the middle of that is how we're to live our lives for the glory of God and with humility towards brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul is making the point when he sees that there's different attitudes and behaviors that don't involve specific commands of Scripture, he understands that churches throughout the ages have been plagued with people who see themselves as spiritually superior than everyone else. Look at verse 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Every one of you, and, and I don't... Don't point if they're in here. You don't even have to write their name in your notes. But over the course of any Christian life, even in youth ministry, there's that person who has always thought that they were a little bit above everybody else. They just, they're they're a little bit further down the road spiritually. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. The person that thinks that may be the most spiritually immature person that you know. Because the people I know that are truly spiritually mature don't revel in their maturity. They recognize that there is a humility before the Lord and it destroys their pride. Why? Because even if you have made some strides spiritually, even if you have grown, what does that produce in you? Does it produce a willingness to stand before the church and say, I want you all to watch me because I am incredible. No. The people that are truly growing, what's happened in their life? It's highlighted to them how much further they have to go. Any of you that are growing spiritually right now, I can tell you that when you, as you have grown, God has been faithful to do something. He's never said, okay, you're good now, just relax. In fact, with every step of growth spiritually, God in turn reveals something else that he is working on us about. Have you seen that in your life? It happens over and over and over again. It destroys the pride of our life. And so when we understand that, what we end up doing now is instead of actually displaying immaturity by an attitude of superiority, we recognize there may be some people that you are more spiritually mature than in this church. If you've been saved for a long time, that ought to be the case. That absolutely ought to be the case. And if you've been saved for a long time and you don't have some spiritual spiritual maturity about you, there's something wrong in your life. But the point of it being that When we all come to faith in Christ, Wednesday night, we're going to baptize 15 brand new believers. We're going to come in here and party. Party? Yes! We are going to exclaim the praises of our God because He's redeemed souls. But what we recognize is God just saved them. And and He's got a long way to go with them. And sometimes with new believers, they may not grasp everything. But guess what? He's got a long way to go with you too. He's got a long way to go with me. And that's Paul's point. 
You see, sometimes this pride of our life is lurking all the time is this temptation. And that temptation towards pride can become a stumbling block for someone else. We're going to talk about that more next week. I've seen that some folks just like to argue. Have you known anybody like that? That's not just in church. We don't have the market cornered on that. Some of you work with people like that. You've got people like that in your family. They'd rather argue than they had get along. I don't know how people live like that, but there are people in the world that you will, and if you hadn't met them yet, let me just warn you, they're coming. They just like to argue. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't mind a good argument. If we're arguing over something that is worthy to be argued about, then we can scratch out a clean place and throw a fit. We can go toe-to-toe. But one of the things that I am so thankful for for the last 16 years of my life is that God has allowed me to pastor a church where I haven't had to oversee bitter, stupid, little arguments among people who call themselves Christians and ought to know better. I'm thankful for that. And I thank you for that. I'm thankful that God is protected with his sovereign hand over that. Sometimes... We know that people need to grow, and we recognize we do too. Sometimes we recognize it's okay to disagree. And sometimes we need to give people the grace to know they have to learn to crawl before they can walk. And jumping on people about non-essentials is absolutely counterproductive. We're going to talk about that in just just a moment in a little bit more detail, because the second point is not only do we need genuine acceptance of one another, but number two, we need clarity on what is essential versus non-essential. Look at verses 5 and 6. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he who gives thanks to God and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. We need clarity on what is essential versus non-essential. People with opposing viewpoints on non-essential, when I say non-essential, I'm talking about things that the Bible is not crystal clear about, that it's possible to be right with God and be on two sides of a fence on certain issues. We're not talking about those things the Bible makes clear. If we are genuinely trying to please God, by our personal conviction, and that conviction does not violate Scripture's explicit command, then the sin takes place when our attitudes take on judgment and superiority. I have some very strong theological convictions. Many of you, after years of being here, you know that. And I think we ought to have strong theological convictions. But I'll tell you this, among those convictions are some where I'll break fellowship with you about. The virgin birth of Christ, the deity of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, salvation by Christ alone, the future coming of Christ. There there are a lot of serious essentials that we can break fellowship over. But there are some issues theologically that even though I deeply am ingrained in the belief of what the Bible teaches. I believe that there are Christian brothers and sisters, though I may disagree with them, that are still saved even though we disagree. I'll even phrase it to you this way. It is possible for them to be saved even though they're wrong. Does that make sense? And for some of you, Even with the theological disagreement you may have with me, it may be, hopefully, you give people enough grace to say, and I think this is a good question, is it possible for them to believe that and still be saved? Sometimes the answer is no. But when the answer is yes, we need to take a step back and realize it's fine for us to have a discussion about this, but let's have a discussion about this as brothers and sisters in Christ, not people who want to fight for the sake of fighting. People are genuinely trying to please God. So what do we look at this? How do we apply this? We don't compromise on our own consciences, but we don't always ram our conscience down someone else's throats on these issues. 
Some things just don't matter. You want to take a note, write that one down. Some things just don't matter. Some things do, others don't. But may God give us the wisdom to see what is essential and what is not. What is not. I give you a specific example when it comes to the church just, just from today. We sang some stuff today that's fairly new. It's within the last 10 years it's been written. We sang some other stuff today that is old. And it was updated. It had a different beat than maybe you had heard before. And I can't get over the fact that sometimes when it comes to music, that people are willing to throw down and fight about that. That's ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. Every song we sing here, it may be your favorite. Some of it's not going to be. But the truth of the matter is, whether or not you like southern gospel, or whether or not you like old hymns, or whether or not you like contemporary, or whether you like a drum, or whether you like a guitar, give me a break. Praise God with the music that is presented. Give Him glory and get over yourself because you're not the only one here. move on from music I got a lot of ground to cover when it comes to certain schedules the Bible did not place in the Bible a prescription for the exact schedule that every church ought to have some schedules are you're going to like better than others but schedules are not something that we're going to throw down about when it comes to parenting tactics the Bible was very clear on the need for godly parenting But some of you approach that differently and have some different convictions about the way that you're going to raise your kids and how you're going to go about that and how you're going to go about training them. Did you know that there is room within Scripture for us to approach our children differently in certain certain areas? Missions. We have people, some people that say that uh, we ought to be across, all over the world. And others who say there's, a lot of lo- there's enough lost people right here around the church. You know what? The answer's not either or. The answer's both and. That's a dumb thing to fight about. We're not going to fight about that here. If you feel called never to leave Pike County, then get busy witnessing to people in Pike County. If you you feel called to go around the world as the Lord opens up those opportunities, then get on the bus or the plane and let's go. When it comes to media, there are a lot of different issues when it comes to, when I say media, consumption, how we use media. Let's be honest. Every one of us in here at this point knows that media can be abused and used for sinful purposes. But at the end of the day, that doesn't mean that all media is sinful. We need to be sure that as we understand the proper use of that, that we apply it correctly as well. Sometimes when it comes to political posturing and how involved people are politically, whether that be demonstrating or how they express their beliefs politically, sometimes in a church you need to realize that there are going to be people who may think that they need to demonstrate while others are more quiet in that, and you can love Jesus and have absolutely both lines of thought. We've seen it, we've seen it highlighted, and I'll bring it up again. We, during COVID, Let me just give you a very, really applicable, something that's been on all of our hearts. How ridiculous is it for Satan to get in a church over a vaccine? Now, some of you are getting nervous right now. Don't get nervous. Here's what you ought to do. If you feel like, and under your doctor's orders, you feel like you should get vaccinated, guess what you ought to do? Get vaccinated. If you feel like under the conviction of God and because of your doctor that you should not get vaccinated, you know what you should do? Not get vaccinated. Now, if you've chosen to get vaccinated, guess what? Your pastor loves you. If you've chosen by your conviction not to get vaccinated, your pastor loves you. And that is not going to be a thing, whether it's vaccines or masks, that we're going to throw down about and let Satan divide a church over. That's just an easy thing for us to be able to talk about because it's absolutely happening. It has happened. We've just lived through that. But those are the type things where we need to step back and we need to realize, hold on, wait a minute. It may be possible for somebody to get a vaccine and still be saved. It may be possible for somebody not to get a vaccine and still be saved. And if that's the case, move on. All right? Move on. So we've got clarity on what is essential versus non-essential. And then we need full acceptance of the Lordship of Christ. 
And this is the most important. Look at verses 7 through 12, specifically verses 7, 8, and 9. None of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So if we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. It is foundational to the unity of every single church that we recognize that Christ is Lord of this church, Christ is the ruler of this church, Christ is the head of this church, and Christ is the reason for this church. And when he goes on in verses 10 through 12, he makes very clear that we're all going to stand before God's judgment seat. We're going to do that single file. We're going to report before him for our deeds done while in the body. So when it comes to our liberty, when it comes to how we should live out our Christian faith, I can remember in high school spending most of my time in a youth group looking for loopholes. Any of you have any clue what I'm talking about? In other words, I tried to figure out what was okay and still be on the good Christian list. Can I do this and still be okay? Can I do this and still, to still be okay? Can I go here? Can I listen to this? Can I watch this? I mean, I spent the whole time because I was, I was Baptist born and Baptist bred. I mean, I was here all the time. I was in church all the time, so it was always in my mind. But when I was in the world, I was trying to figure out, now, wait a minute, what can I do? I was always wanting to figure out how I could push the limits but still be in the Christian category. I know probably none of you in here have ever dealt with that. But it was real for me. And so I just want to give some very specific advice. I don't have a lot of time left, but, but let me give you a couple of examples to help you with that. The question or not, the biggest question we should be asking is not whether or not we can do something, but whether or not doing that thing will please Jesus. That's the easiest question to ask. Teenagers, young people, when you're talking about being in a relationship and you're thinking about what you were involved in physically in a relationship, can you do that and please Jesus? That's the question. It's not how far is far enough or how far is too far. It's can I do that and please Jesus. When it comes to movies and entertainment, can I watch that movie and please Jesus? When it comes to music, can I listen to that song and please Jesus? How should I spend my Sundays? Can you do what you are doing and please Jesus? Where should I go to church? Can I go there and it please Jesus? Now, Maybe it is that if we spent some more time, you could come up with 50 more examples. Those are just to get you started on thinking about application. But the issue that we should all be thinking about is not a police state, but it's thinking about unity and diversity and in our own lives on issues that we are not sure that maybe there's not a specific command in Scripture, then we simply say, can doing this please Jesus? And our greatest concern, our greatest concern in the world should be that we are going to be judged by him. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I want you to know if you're a believer, that is not a judgment to see whether or not you're going to be let in or thrown out. That's the sheep and the goat judgment. What you will stand before God for is a rewards judgment to see how you've lived your life, how you will be rewarded in the next one, and how we treat other people inside the body of Christ that's going to make a huge difference. So friends, I want to tell you, he is worthy. He's worthy of your life. He's worthy of the diversity in the church. He's worthy of unity in the church. And he is worthy of you doing everything that you can to make sure that his church is healthy and unified in that. Would you stand with me?